Wise um, sermon series. What we're talking about is we're ba- this whole sermon series is basically based on 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27 where it says God, the Bible says God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. What that means is that people that seem like experts today, but they don't have the knowledge of the Lord, they don't believe in the Lord, God is actually going to confound those people. The sm- we'll look at some of the smartest people. Or, when I put that in quotes, um, we looked last time at Jordan Peterson. This morning, we're going to be looking at a very popular um, media personality this morning. His name is Joe Rogan. Um, he's a very popular um, podcaster. He started, uh, Joe Rogan started his career as a stand-up comedian. Um, he's a TV host for many years, and he now has the most popular podcast in the United States. Joe Rogan, the reason that he's made um, this sermon series is because Joe Rogan has 11 million daily listeners. 11 million daily listeners. That means that he's more popular than Rush Limbaugh was. He, he's, he, has more, uh, he has more listeners every day than the most popular conservative commentator that has ever lived. And the reason I bring up Joe Rogan is because he's very popular with conservatives today. And even some, what I would call, you know, what people would call conservative Christians today. So we'll look, look at this um, a little bit more towards the end of the sermon. But look, the point is, he's, he's very popular and people give him accolades for this, his ability to remain impartial. To look at both sides of issues. To be totally open-minded. This is what people say about why they listen to Joe Rogan. He, you know, he's, he's been uh, very popular with conservatives and Christian conservatives with his view on the, you know, alternate treatments to coronavirus and the coronavirus uh, vaccine. You know, his war with CNN has been very popular amongst Christian conservatives in the United States. United States. He's actually become a little bit of a hero to the American conservative today, even the American Christian conservative today. So let's begin by looking at what he actually believes. Let's look at his views, and if they line up with what the Bible says, with what we believe, you know, where does he stand? I mean, is he at least, is he at least open-minded to things? We understand, look, we understand that, you know, most people aren't saved. Most people today don't believe the Bible. Don't, don't get me wrong. We get that, okay? But is he at least open-minded? Is he, is he furthering Christian principles today? You know, we love to give everyone a chance, here, right? We love to hold out hope um, for a lot of people here, but let's look at Joe Rogan's balanced views. On Christianity, on this idea, let's start with his religious views, okay? On this idea that even just this idea like we looked at last time with Jordan Peterson, the idea that there is a God and that this God had a son. Just those simple steps, just on the idea, the basic idea of Christianity, Joe Rogan says he says there's literally no proof. I mean, because Christianity, at the end of the day, with no proof, everything is mythology. Everything. With no proof. With proof, then you examine the proof. It's super simple. And anybody that argues against that is just, you're just biased. You, you have your own ideas. If you have some proof that there was a God, that this God had one son, and he made this son come down and get beat out of him and nailed to a board so that we could all have no sin. Do you have, can you show me some studies? Can you give, do you, do you have a box of evidence that you can pull out and we can examine all the different pieces that points to the undeniable conclusion that that's true? Because if you don't, then it's a myth. Then you're, you're believing mythology. Doesn't mean it's not real, but if you, if you put all your eggs in that basket and you don't have any proof at all, well, you're entering into this weird world where you don't pay attention to it. You're entering into this weird world where you, you ignore certain aspects of things because you've decided what is and what isn't. Th- that's not thinking. That's not thinking. That's like it's convenient cookie holder placement of ideas. It's not thinking. Because if you're thinking, you can't accept it. If you're thinking, you go, wait, what? He came back from the dead? Has anybody ever done that? Three days? Came back from the dead. So let's just, I mean, let's just take a look at just that idea alone, that there's just zero evidence for God, for the existence of, you know, the validity of the Bible. I mean, look, we, we are King James only here. We have a King James Bible. If you are here, you, ha- you are holding a King James Bible in your hand. What, what, what is that? I mean, where did it come from? Look, here's the, here's, 
here's the zero evidence right here. On the, just the New Testament alone, there is over, uh, five, let's we'll just say 5,000. There's like 5,800, most people will agree. 5,000 actual transcripts in Greek that have been found that, that literally match each other almost to the, to the word. Okay? On non-Greek manuscripts for just the New Testament itself, there's over 18,000 manuscripts. He says in his, in his podcast on this rant against the Bible, he says, can you show me a box of evidence somewhere? Somebody actually did the math on this, but if you actually took all the transcripts that have been found, the actual Greek transcripts of the New Testament, they would stack like a mile high. How's that for a box? Do you have a box of evidence that you can pull out and we can examine all the different pieces that points to the undeniable conclusion that that's true? You know, there's, there's your box of evidence. There's more manuscripts found for the New Testament than there is for any classical writing. And it's not even close. You know, Homer's Iliad and some of these classical, you know, um, classical findings, they found like 1,000, 1,500 manuscripts, where the Bible has over 20,000 manuscripts that have been found. Look, that's just the documentation that has been found for the Bible. Okay, I mean, if that's not evidence, I mean, maybe he just doesn't know this. Maybe he's just unaware of this. But now let's look at just the King James Bible itself. Let's look at the King James Bible itself. What are you holding in your hand in the King James Bible? Did you know that the King James Bible, the books of the Bible, they were written, all the books from Genesis to Revelation, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it was written over a period of 1,500 years. When I mean penned down by men. It was penned down by men. There was over 40, 40 individual human authors of those books that make up the King James Bible. These authors were everybody from, from kings to religious leaders to doctors to tax collectors down to the lowest fishermen. Not to put down fishermen. But the point is, is that it was written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different people, by dozens of different people that did not know each other. This is what you're holding in your hand with the King James Bible. They, but there's no mistakes in it. There's no contradictions in it. Not only that, every single book in that Bible that you're holding in your hand, it all points to the same person, Jesus Christ. It, the Old Testament books themselves point to the future person of Christ. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of prophecies that were written in the Old Testament that were then fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Dozens of different prophecies, from messianic prophecies to end time prophecies to things that have happened to things that will happen. They've, look, to believe all this was fake, you would have to believe, well, first of all, you'd have to believe that all these men were somehow like geniuses that wrote all this down. They were geniuses. Think about this. All these men were geniuses that wrote this down, and especially with the New Testament. They were geniuses that for some reason came up with this, this the biggest con that the world has ever seen, and they gained nothing except losing everything and dying horrible deaths for it. That's what you would have to believe. The point I'm trying to get at you this morning is that the existence of the book itself is a miracle. God had to have a hand in it. God had to hand, have a hand in it. A lot of people will say, hey, you can't use, you, that's circular logic, man. They'll say, you can't use the thing itself to prove the authenticity of the thing. Well, guess what? That's wrong. I'm going to show you why. I have an object lesson for you this morning. You know how much I like? object lessons. But here's the thing, you can. You can use the existence of something to prove that it is something. Look, I'm not trying to prove God to you this morning, all right? But I'm just trying to show you just the uneducation and the foolishness of statements like this. Now look, I brought, a, I brought, a, um, I brought an object lesson for you this morning. Just set this right here. Let's say, um, to prove the existence of something, we can't use that something. 
All right, so let me just give you an object lesson. Let's say I found this miraculous, I found this miraculous machine. This machine, it runs on no batteries, it runs on no fuel, it just runs. This is the, the, the mythical perpetual motion machine, right? Look, I, th I'm telling you right now, this machine, there is no batteries, there is no wires. It's, we've got it stuck to the stand here, sorry. It just runs. It just runs. Now, let's say that I found a machine like this. I found a machine that just, it seemed to just get energy from nowhere. It seemed to just run on its own. And it just completely defies the first law of thermodynamics. It completely defies the second law of thermodynamics. It just runs. The machine itself is a miracle because it's running. I'm not doing anything. I'm not adding to it. It's just, it's just running. Doesn't the machine itself prove that it's a miracle? because of the fact that it's running, because of the fact of what it can do, because of the fact of what it is. That is what I'm trying to get you to understand is the Bible. Because the Bible exists, because you have a book that is written by all these different men over over a thousand years that completely matches and doesn't have any errors in it and completely points to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and that completely, and by the way, there's never been another book ever that applies to every single person that has ever lived on the face of the earth, ever. That's a miracle in itself. I don't care who you are, the Bible will change your life. I don't care who you are, if you listen to the Bible and you believe the Bible, you will be in heaven. If you believe the gospel, you will be in heaven. If you understand the Bible and you put the Bible into practice in your life, it will change your life. That is a miracle. It applies to every single person. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you did in your past. It doesn't matter what country you came from, who your parents were. The Bible will change your life. The Bible will change your eternal destination. It will change your life on this earth. It's a miracle in itself. So obviously this is not a perpetual motion machine. Uh, but, it, but it's proving to you that the miracle of a machine, the miracle of God's word, is proof that God preserved his word for us. Now look, here's a, here's a little challenge for the homeschoolers in the room, or the kids in the room. If you can tell me what kind of engine this is, and then you can explain it, the first kid that can explain what kind of engine this is and how it works, I will give them the engine, okay? Moving on, back to the sermon. So the point is, is that we can use the Bible to prove the authenticity of the Bible. Now look, like I said, I'm not trying to prove God to you this morning, but here's another miracle of the Bible, and it shows the in ingenious design of the Bible from God. Look, the irony is this. The Bible, turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. The Bible tells us that people will not be able to understand it. The Bible tells us that it's a spiritual book and that there's going to be people that don't understand the miracle of the Bible. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 16. I'm just trying to show you, you know, the disingenuity and, you know, the, the uneducation of this man about the Bible, about God, about Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 in verse number, three, six, in verse number 16. Look at the Bible says. It says in verse 15, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him that hath written unto you, as also in his epistles, this is the, the New Testament books, speaking his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. It, he's saying here is that there are some things in the Bible that are hard to understand. Look, the gospel is not one of these. The gospel is very simple. But there are things in the Bible that the unlearned and the unstable will just, they will not, they will just wrestle with it. They will just, they, they will not be able to understand it. Look, if you know nothing about the Bible, you're unlearned. Okay, and I've never seen a book that people will talk so much about, pretend to know so much about, that they've never read it because they don't understand it. But here's a circle of irony about the Bible for you. Joe Rogan will never recognize the miracle of the Bible, of this machine right here, because the, his heart is not able to accept the gospel. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, or I'll just read it for you. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what it takes to be saved is that someone would read for you the word of God. 
would read the gospel to you from the Word of God. This is what we do when we go out soul winning. We go out and we ask, hey, do you want to know um, how God tells you you can know you're going to heaven? And people will be like, yeah, sure. And then we show them. And then if their heart is right, they will accept that truth. And at that point, they will begin to understand what the Bible says. That, that's, that's what the Bible says. This is the ingenuity of God's Word right here. Is that you first must have faith and accept the gospel, and then you will recognize the miracle of the Bible. This is why you get so many people out there, they're just like, it's just, it's just nonsense. They read like four, four lines in it, and they're just like, I can't, I can't even make any sense of that. Because it's complicated to them. But once you're saved, you can begin to understand those things. It's a spiritual book, folks. It's a spiritual miracle. It's a miracle, the design of the Bible. You accept it by faith. Over and over and over in the New Testament, Jesus says, he that hath ears to hear. What Jesus is saying is people that have their hearts right will hear this, will understand this, will accept that. That's why he says, he that hath ears to hear. Jesus is out there just speaking truth after truth after truth. And he's saying, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But some people's heart is hard towards the Bible. Look, we see these people every week. People have no interest. They don't believe it and all that. But look, until then, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Until people open their heart to the gospel, these are who these people are. Look at 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and look at verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. This is what this is talking about. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The man that doesn't have faith, that doesn't believe the Bible, is not going to receive, he's not going to see that miracle of what is in these pages. For their, for their what? It, it doesn't say he just doesn't believe them. It says their foolishness unto him. It says people that are just natural, that are not saved, that don't have the Spirit of God, they're going to read the Bible. They'll be like, this doesn't even, it just seems silly. Exactly what Joe Rogan says about the Bible, about God, and about Jesus. So look, when Psalm 12, 6 says the words of the Lord are pure words, and it says, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. This is a promise from God. O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. When God gives us that promise that he will preserve his word for us, I can, just like this machine, I can hold up the King James Bible, and I can see this perfect word, and I can say God kept that promise because this exists. See, so you can prove the existence of something through the miracle of what exists. Let's go back to this zero evidence for God. There's plenty of secular historians, by the way, that have documented the per a person called Jesus. You know, the first century, there was a guy called Tac Tacitus, Tacitus? Flavius Josias in the fir first century was a Jewish historian. Julius Africanus, a second century historian. The Babylonian Talmud talks about Jesus. Lucian of Samosota, the second century Greek writer, talks about Jesus. Merab Arcepian, the first century Roman philosopher, talks about Jesus. Then even the fake Gnostic Gospels that have been found. Look there, th these are not accurate descriptions of Jesus, which is why they're not in the Bible which is why they're not the Word of God, but they talk about a person, they document a person called Jesus. But my favorite evidence of Jesus Christ is the testimony. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. My favorite piece of evidence outside the Bible. Of course, we have the Bible. That's all we need. But everything, my favorite evidence outside the Bible of the existence of Jesus Christ is the fact that literally thousands of Christians in just the first century alone were willing to die and give their lives for Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that the martyrs, the reason that these people were stoned, Hebrews chapter 11, right before Hebrews chapter 12, where you're turning, talks about, you know, the great men of God, the men throughout history, the great witnesses that were surrounded by. The Bible tells us they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were slain with the sword. Why? Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. The, one of the main reasons that they were slain with the sword and the reasons for that happening to them was seeing we are so encompassed about with so great a cloud of what? Witnesses. 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The reason all these men and the reason all of these documented martyrs in secular books like that, is that a small book? Thousands of martyrs throughout history. The reason that they existed was as they are a witness to Jesus Christ to us. They're a witness. Not only that Jesus existed and he said who he said he was who he said he was, but just a witness so we can run the race. It's like we can't even come to church. We can't even serve the Lord with just a few hours of our week. And these people died and lived miserable lives and were tortured to death for the name of Christ. It's like we can do nothing. We take eternal life and we're just going to hold that up and just live our worldly life. No, these witnesses were given for us. They were given for the world. They were given for us so we can run the race that we're supposed to run. But it's all fake. It's all fake. I mean, I was actually shocked. Looking into to Joe Rogan, I was actually shocked at my findings here. I mean, I knew he was a secular humanist. I knew he believed in evolution. I knew he was an atheist. But I had no idea the depth of his ignorance on this subject. You know, I know I can just see the people in the comments on this video on YouTube already. Oh, man, just I hope you get saved. I mean, I listen to him anyway, man. You know, I mean, but look, let me, let me give you some more evidence along those lines. Should be, you be listening to him. First of all, he just completely makes fun of Jesus Christ. Because if you're thinking, you can't accept it. If you're thinking, you go, wait, what? He came back from the dead? Has anybody ever done that? Three days? Came back from the dead. I don't think you can do that. <laughs> I mean, that's what people would do uh, normally. <coughs> but... You know, like I went to my kid had a function today, and I went to uh, this function, and they're all uh, they're, we're singing "God Bless America," and there's like something about heaven in there, and their school prayer. I'm like, well, okay, are you t are we teaching pe people? We're teaching kids things, right? What's heaven? Where, where is this? Is this a real thing? Are we just pretending heaven's real so the kids feel good and they can get through uh, 12th grade? You're just making it up. You're teaching a school in a class. You're making them, and then in heaven, God in heaven, God in heaven. Where's heaven? Who's God? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're making up some You're making up some in a school. Like, and you don't, okay, like if the kid comes to you, like, um, where is heaven on a map? Can you, uh, can you take me to, is, do we have a Google Earth? Can we check out heaven? <laughs> can I see the, can I see the harp? Oh, well, no, you know, heaven is, is our fa heavenly father. That was another thing, heavenly father. Like, our heavenly father, really? This is what we're teaching in school? Heavenly fathers. How come he's not a chick? You know? Moms are usually better at, like, raising you than dads. Dad's working all the time. <laughs> it is weird that, that when you have a kid that you do nothing but lie to them their, their first 10 years of their life, like, about Santa Claus, bunny rabbits, Jesus, yeah. monsters. Well, the Jesus thing keeps going. A guy who was magic and could turn water into wine, who could heal people. What did he do with fish? Did he give people fish or something? Make some fish? The whole thing's so stupid. Just complete blasphemy. He says the whole story of Jesus is so stupid, is what he says. He makes fun of all the miracles in the Bible. And then what he does when he looks at, because he's open-minded, right? He's open-minded, so he brings people that have the Christian, um, you know, the Christian perspective, he'll bring them on his show. But what he does is he sets up a straw man. He sets up a straw man. He'll bring on, like, he'll talk about, like, the Pope. Let's talk about like the Pope. Well, the Pope believes in evolution. The Pope, you know, believes in the Big Bang and all this kind of stuff. Well, the Pope probably does. I don't know, but the Pope's going to hell with every other every other person who doesn't believe the Bible. He sets up straw men. He'll find like the craziest sects of you know heretical Christians. Even we'll go out soul winning, and even people that used to be Catholic know that that's not Christian. You'll go up and you know you be oh you're Catholic, and they're like no I'm Christian. <laughs> they know that Catholicism is not biblical Christianity. You know, he'll bring up, that's why he had Jordan Peterson on his show. He'll bring up this lunatic who knows nothing, doesn't even believe the Bible, doesn't believe in Jesus himself to represent Christianity for us. Like he's just setting up a straw man so it's easy to knock down the stupidity of Christianity. So you're into nonsense. Is that what this is? Because this is, you're showing nonsense. You got this guy dressed like he's a 
Harry Potter movie, and he's standing in front of all these people with a chalice. He's wearing a cult outfit. He literally is wearing a cult outfit from a thousand years ago. And you're all sitting there listening to this nonsense, total nonsense. He's not even speaking it in English. And you're there. You're like, yes, we're here. We're here to wis witness the Holy Father. But he's not just lost, is what I'm trying to get at this morning. He's literally against God. He's against the idea of it. He's blasphemous. He's against the whole idea of the Bible. Galatians 6, 7. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and look at verse number 7. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about, you know, how God's going to take, you know, being made fun of, being mocked? The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God's not mocked. I don't have to say anything more there. God will take care of this. But we shouldn't have anything to do with it. And that's the point of this sermon. Turn to James chapter 4. So that's his take on religion. All right, that's his take on religion. You say, what about everything else? Well, maybe he's got some views that I agree with. What about everything else? Maybe, you know, I like his take on politics or, or you know, the world. I think he's, he's pretty conservative. Look at James chapter 4. Here's a better way to characterize Joe Rogan right here. Look at James chapter 4 and verse number 4. The Bible says, ye adulterers and adulteress, adulteresses, Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This, it, this wraps Joe Rogan up right here. He's not conservative. He does not have biblical values. He does not hold biblical views. He, he literally holds the views of the world. James chapter 4 and verse number 4 is Joe Rogan. He is the world. And if you are giving heed to that, you are listening to that, you're a friend of the world. And you know God. God's not like, oh, you can be gray. God's like, you're with me or you're against me, buddy. Look, he pretends to be someone that has unique views on things. But he's just another mainstream liberal is all he is. He's anti-God. He's pro-evolution. He's pro-abortion. I'm 100% pro-choice. He's pro-LGBTQZYX, whatever it is now. He's pro-drugs. In, in full disclosure, Ron and I smoked marijuana with young Jamie before this podcast. Yes, we As did. I do so many others. And ultimately, here's the thing, folks. He holds all these mainstream liberal views. That, that's, he's, he's not, why, what in the world? If I was a conservative that wasn't even Christian, why would I be listening to this? Here's the thing. He's completely disingenuous. He's a coward. Because when he does stumble across something where, you know, he, he you know, he has common sense on something, because every now and then, you know, a, a broken clock is twice, you know, right twice a day. When he does stumble across, you know, like the, he got himself in trouble on like the trans sport issue that's coming up. So like a couple of years ago, you know, it was real, it was real big in the MMA, like the mixed martial arts world, you know, the trans sport issue, like this issue. I mean, this is the most hilarious thing in the world to me, but I'll get to that in a second. But basically he took a position of common sense. He took a position of common sense. He didn't, he doesn't believe the Bible. Look, you don't have to believe the Bible to understand that you got a bunch of homosexual men beating up women. That's what you have here. And he says, he says, yeah, man. That was the big one. And that was where I really understood, like, how bizarre and the how defensive cult, for that. Yeah, how cult-like this, this ideology is. It doesn't make any sense. No, of course not. The bone structure is so different, and people that deny that are crazy. I know. That's, that, that is silly, man. It's or, like, what if, what if I, like, transition, whatever, anyone, a man, and there's a powerlifting? And well, like, people have done that, and they're winning and breaking all these records. Of course they are. Yeah. And why are we like? Why are we not stopping being like that? Doesn't no. That doesn't. Because count. we want to save people's feelings. Exactly. Huge fire. He even called like the LGBT trans community like a cult back then. Like if you uh, disagree with it, you know they're just going to come after you. And that's exactly what happened to him. He got just just beat up by all these people. And look, it's basically you know. He came under all this fire, and on January 15, 2022, he basically says, okay, I've changed my mind. As long as the other opponent is aware of it, it's fine. As if any fighter would not be aware that they were fighting some, you know, transgender freak or whatever, right? I mean, look, as if that changes. It's actually it's at, it's at, as if knowing who you're fighting changes the biology of the situation. 
It's the most bizarre thing in the world. But look, I, I love this issue because what it's doing is it's bringing to the limelight just the perversion of liberal ideology. And this perversion is just imploding on itself. I mean, the Ivy League swimming championships are dominated now by two homosexual men. They're just destroying all these women. And all these liberal people in these Ivy League, they're just like, it's a bunch of guys. It's a bunch of, you know, f freakish reprobates. And the reason that I love it is because it shows that this ideology will destroy itself. Look, this ideology will destroy our nation. And maybe, just maybe, as people with common sense see this ridiculousness and this wickedness, maybe it will drive more people towards the truth of the Bible. Because we know what it is. People have a conscience. They see this and they're like, that's wicked. Because God wrote his law in their heart. People recognize this. But he changes his mind. Look, the reason he walks these things back, it's all about the money, folks. That's all it is. There's not, he, he's just, as he's lifted up by even conservatives as this countercultural revolutionary, he's just another liberal, politically correct media sellout. That's all he is. He just packages it better than most people. Turn to Joshua chapter 11. Oh, but he's, he's, he's pro, like he was against like all the coronavirus stuff and he was anti-coronavirus mandates, vaccine mandates and all this. Okay, does that mean we can yoke up with people that might have a couple views that we can be sympathetic towards? Look at Joshua chapter 11. Look at verse number one. Look, this is what God's enemies do. Look at Joshua chapter 11 and verse number one. Joshua chapter 11 and verse number one. The children of Israel are coming into the promised land. And they're just destroying people. They're coming in there and the Lord's fighting for them and they're winning all these battles. Look what their enemies do in Joshua chapter 11 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard these things, that he sent to Jobab, the king of Madan, and, and the king of Chimron, and to the king of Ashath, and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains and the plains of the south of Chinneroth, and in the valley and the borders of Dor to the west, and to the Canaanite in the east, to the west, to the Amorite, to the Hittite, to the Perizzite, to the Jebusite in the mountains, and to the Hivite under Hermon in the land of Mitzvah. He goes out and he just gathers up all these people. Look, these people that I just read off to you, they have nothing in common. They didn't worship the same gods. They all had different cultures. They all had different people. They had nothing in common. Yet they all get together to fight the Lord. And look, that, just get used to that. Our enemies will always yoke up against us. Our enemies will always yoke up against us. They'll yoke up with people even hated. The same day they will yoke up against the people. Look, it's, it's, you know what it is? It's Sun Tzu's, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But Sun Tzu did not write the Bible. We do not operate that way. We cannot operate that way. Look, Christians do not have this luxury to just yoke up with whoever we want. As, as a matter of fact, the Bible says the opposite. But people, they look at his stance on, you know, his CNN fight and, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, but the point is, when the pressure came on, even with these things, he backed off. He backed off. He changed his, his threat. He was, he was threatened to lose his big contract for hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever it was. And he basically came out and he apologized even for all the COVID stuff. He's basically like, you know, I was, in, I was uneducated. These podcasts are very strange because they're just conversations. And oftentimes I have no idea what I'm going to talk about until I sit down and talk to people. And that's why some of my ideas are not that prepared or fleshed out. He basically comes out to save himself millions of dollars and calls himself an idiot. He basically loves money so much that he would call himself an idiot to the world just to keep going. So he's not, he's not genuine, folks. Are you, I mean, you, hopefully you're recognizing a pattern here. But look, go to Colossians chapter 3 where we started. We should be separate from this. All this being said, we should be separate from this. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 8. Or just look at the front of your bulletin. It's the verse of the week. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 8. And then turn, you're going to go after that, you're going to turn to 2 Timothy. Turn to 2 Timothy. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 8. 
Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, now put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, and then look what it says here. Blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You say, well, I don't, you know, I don't blaspheme the Lord, and I don't have filthy communication. Well, now turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's tie these two things together. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and look at verse number 16. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse number 16. The Bible says, it says but shun. It says, it doesn't say, don't say these things. It says, shun profane and vain babblings. It's saying, you should not even be around these things. You should be away from profane and vain babblings. You should be away from profanity. Did you know that? Why? Because you will become profane. That's what Colossians 3.8 is saying. You will become profane. Look at the last part of the verse of 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 16. Shun profane and vain babblings. I love the Bible because it explains why it says things. Why should we shun profane and vain babblings? For they will increase unto more ungodliness. If you're around a bunch of people that are just into all this sin, if you're around a bunch of people that just speak like, you know, just completely profane, profane people, perversion, and all this, look, you will become that way. You will start to speak that way. And that's what the Bible is saying. So you should put this stuff away from you. And forget the fact that it's blasphemy and that you're basically betraying the Lord Jesus Christ as you listen to somebody who just, just mocks him openly. Do you want to be in that camp? You know, why would you be friends with someone that hates the Lord? Look, he's, he's basically the world, folks. And you know, the thing is, he's redefining manhood. He's redefining manhood as this vulgar, you know, worldly, you know, person. He's redefining culture in America. This is why I bring him up in this sermon series. This is not for us. This is not for us. And all this being said, let me say this. And for the entirety of this series, let me say this. I am for the free market of ideas. I am not saying we should shut down Joe Rogan. I am saying we should not have any part of it. Because guess what? I'm actually, I'm actually for free market of ideas. You know why? Because we have the best idea. Just think about it this way. Most censorship today, think about this by the way. Most censorship today is not coming from the government. It's coming from private companies. And the only reason that, they, that private companies would want someone like Joe Rogan, because they don't care, is because there's a market for it. Imagine if all of a sudden America just became this Bible-believing Christians, and they, just, like, they were just for the Bible, everybody got saved, and they were just like sold out for Christ. Like, there'd be no market for this garbage. Nobody would want him. Look, they have the right. Private companies, by the way, have the right to lift up or silence whoever they want. So the fact that you know, a free market society promotes somebody like this, it shows you the state of the culture in our country. It's a problem with the morality of the people. That's why somebody like this exists and is successful. Think about it this way. I'm for the free market of ideas because guess what? We have the best idea. Can you imagine? Just, just do it. Let's do a thought experiment for a second. Between friends of ours, let's just think about, you know, First Works, Verity, Sure Foundation, us, just like the West Coast churches that we're friends with. Just think about, you know, at Boise, you know, Shield of Faith, I don't want to leave anyone out. But the point is, think about this. We send out thousands of soul winners every single year. We go out with the Bible, and we go knocking doors. We talk to literally thousands of people every single year. You know what's never happened? I've never seen anyone or even heard of anyone come back like, oh man, lost a couple to the Mormons. <laughs> oh man, Brother Matt went out soul winning and he's a Mormon now. Ah! Oh man, lost a couple to the Catholics. Brother Trevor became a Buddhist yesterday. You know, I mean, I've never, I mean, uh, you know, look, the ministry is difficult at times, but I've never had that difficulty where I have to go home to my wife and be like, oh, man, you know, Brother Ryan is worshiping fruit now. <laughs> because the other ideas are dumb. They're stupid. We believe the Bible. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We have the best idea. We need to keep it free. We need to keep the ideas out there because we'll win every single time. Every single time. As, wrong, as long as hearts are right, as long as your heart is right, and you have the ears to hear, I don't care what background you came from, the Bible can get you saved. As long as you have the ears to hear and your heart is open to it. Because guess what? 
God gave you that conscience, Roman 2.15. God, God wrote that, that law in your heart. And when somebody comes up to you with the gospel, that key fits perfectly as long as your heart is not damaged towards the word of God. So look, I'm, all, I'm not saying we should shut people down. I'm saying we should get right in this country. People should shut off blasphemy. They should shut off profanity. And this problem will fix itself. But that's a pretty powerful proof right there that I've never lost anyone or heard of a pastor friend of mine who's lost anyone to some false you know, heresy when they're out spreading the gospel. The freer this market remains, the better it will be for the kingdom of God. And by the way, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. This same reason is why it will always be the Bible view that is silenced first. You ever wonder why, oh, social media and all these people, they're cracking down on things. What are they cracking down on? They're cracking down on the Bible. They're cracking down on the Word of God. They're cracking down on the truth. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. This is why, right here. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look, that doesn't say just the government. That could be spiritual wickedness at Google, at Facebook, at Twitter, all these social media companies. Look, Satan's got control of all of them. What is popular in our country today is a measure of his success in this department. Don't forget that. So what's the conclusion of the matter here? The conclusion of the matter is he hates the idea of even God, Joe Rogan. He mocks God. He tries to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He tries to take both sides of things. That's another thing that he does. That everybody like just gives him accolades on. He, oh, he takes both sides of things. You know, many times he does try to take both sides of things. And, I, and I, as I've shown you, when he takes a certain side of something and then he gets beat up too much and he's threatened with money, he'll just go to the other side. But look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Or verse, um, sorry, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3 and look at verse number 8. Look, there's only one side. The Bible says that there's a time to love and a time to hate. The Bible says a time of, a time of war and a time of peace. Listen, folks, someone that believes everything believes nothing. Someone that believes everything. Look, you can't, you can't love children and then, you know, also love child perversion and all this, these, these sickos that everyone just lets go out in society. Look, you have to hate evil if you love the good. That's what the Bible is saying here. You know, but everybody just redefines these words like love, like hate. They just redefine all these things. Oh, you can't ever hate anything. Oh, really? Do you love Hitler? Idiots. It's the dumbest thing in the world. If you love everything, you hate nothing and you love nothing. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He believes nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We are to be separate from the world and the filth in it. That's the bottom line. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is talking about things that should be allowed in the church and things that shouldn't be allowed in the church. But there's an interesting verse in verse number 10 that says this. Look, the Bible is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10 and verse number 11, verse number 11 it says there's six things that you can't allow in the church. But in verse number 10, it's saying, look, it says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. He's talking about fornication, being covetous, extortioners, idolaters, the same sins he brings up in verse 11 that you're not to allow in the church. He says, but yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. For then must ye need to go out of the world. This is saying that, look, as a Christian man, I'm going to have to go out in the world and I'm going to like run into people like this. I'm going to run into people that are in fornication, people that are covetous, people that are extortioners. It's saying they shouldn't be allowed in the church in verse 11, but it's like we're going to be amongst these people. As we go to work, as you deal in your business life with people, you're going to run into unsaved people that just aren't following the Bible in their life. You know, it's very specific on the church, but he says, you're going to be amongst these people. But guess what? It is another thing to voluntarily expose yourself to this filthy entertainment, profane entertainment, and, you know, blasphemous entertainment. You are choosing to put yourself, to entertain yourself with things that the Lord hates. 
So don't forget that. So remember my comment at the beginning of the sermon where it says, you know, he's, he's very popular with conservatives. He's pop, you know, not that conservative means Christian. Hopefully you understand now that conservative means less and less Christian-like every single day. And what this guy is actually doing, liberals should love him, because what he's actually doing is he's taking the Christian right and he's moving them farther to the left. I'm sorry, the right to the left. So what he's doing is he's changing the culture of this country. But guess what? We don't move. We don't move. That is the definition of fundamental, is that this is our, this is our position. And we do not move, ever. People say, oh, you're peculiar. Guess what? You're going to start thinking I'm even more and more peculiar. Because as the, as the world keeps going left, they're going to be like, what are you doing over there? And I'm like, I'm staying right here. That's what I'm doing. And people are going to be like, yeah, that's weird. It's weird that you, you dress appropriately and that you don't speak like everybody else speaks. That is the one thing, by the way, as, as a Christian who is not profane, you start a new job somewhere, people will know that you're a Christian within 30 seconds. Because the world is so profane now, it's ridiculous. People come up to you and be like, oh man, something's different about you. Because you don't, you know, swear every fifth word. But that is beautiful. It's a witness, people. It's a witness. We don't move, folks. Joe Rogan, completely confused, completely confounded. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.